Let me introduce Neil first. Neil, of course, if you read the Sun Times, it's tough on Saturday. You have to get through their Sports Illustrated to get to the hard news, Neil. Some people follow that. I know. I know they do. But if you just open the front page of the Sun Times, there it is. One of the great columnists that we're entitled to read about, read about his sons, his wife, and all the issues that Neil likes to get involved in. Neil has been a member of the Sun-Times staff since 1987, and he's written for a wide variety of publications, including Esquire, Rolling Stone, The Washington Post, and so on. He's the author of eight books, the last two published by the University of Chicago Press, so you know there are real books. <laughs> we don't have the other ones. <laughs> Neil, we appreciate your comments in the paper last week about your coming here to uh, moderate with uh, Karen. That was a real nice plug at the City Club. We're very, very grateful for that. Okay, our speaker is Karen Teitelbaum, who's the president and CEO of the Sinai Health System. Karen is a native of Brooklyn, New York, probably a Dodger fan. Um, she is the president and chief executive officer at the Sinai Health System, which many of us know is an urban teaching healthcare system that's comprised of four hospitals, an epidemiological research institute that focuses on healthcare disparities. There are over 15 distinct programs in that institute. Sinai has over 800 medical staff members, 3,600 employees. They're focused on the delivery of high quality services in an efficient and cost effective manner. The Sinai Health System has achieved national recognition in quality while reducing costs by millions of dollars due to greater efficiency and management in population health. Karen Teitelbaum was the 2018 recipient of the Woman of Science Award from the Weizmann Institute, the Leadership in Healthcare Administration from the National Medical Fellowship Association, and has been named one of Crane's Chicago's Notable Women in Healthcare. And if, like me, you had a surgical procedure done at Northwestern Hospital by a Dr. Ezra Teitelbaum, they're not related. <laughs> but Karen told me she's going to check him up and see if he's really legitimate. So, Neil. Take it away. Karen, take it away. After that, where do you go? I mean, all, all title bombs are probably related in some way. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, with the rise of social media and the internet, uh, it's sort of cool that people come out in person and hear speakers talk and eat food. It's very 19th century. And so, uh, or very 21st century, uh, one, of the, one of the two. But uh, Karen, I want to thank you for coming out and talking to us about uh, what is a, a sadly relevant uh, topic, healthcare and violence. Uh, we had, I saw in the paper in the Sun-Times today that nine people were killed in Chicago over the weekend, uh, which is the most in 18 years, and 15 were shot, including a seven-year-old girl. So this is something that people face in the city every day or don't face. People such as ourselves sometimes turn away from it. But my first question is that's not something that Sinai can do. I spent time in their trauma, their level one trauma center in, in October doing a story, and I saw that the people just coming in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so what I'm asking is that, uh, uh, how does Sinai try to prevent violence? I mean, obviously someone shot, they come in, you have to take right. care of them, right. but you also work with the community trying to keep them from ever being shot. And that's something people don't think about. And I thought we would start there. Yeah, and you know, that that is, first of all, thank you, Neil. And, and I do have to say, if you've read Neil's promo in the Sun-Times, never have I ever seen the, the phrases emergency department staff and singing sea shanties used together. So I think Neil gets some applause for that. So, 
you know, I mean, that, that whole issue of, yes, we treat people, obviously, when they come in and, and we get them well and we send them back out. Um, but I think there's the bigger issue, if we dig into what is, what is the bigger overriding issue about this. When you look at um, the trends in Chicago um, in homicides, there has been, uh, between 2017 and 2018, a 14% decrease. And that sounds really good, right? But then when you dig in and you look at the um, uh, more of the social issues and, and the disproportionate burden of who's impacted by those homicides, 80% of the homicide victims in Chicago are African American and 16% are Latinx. So there's, there's kind of, for me, a, a bigger issue of, you know, how do you start addressing these, uh, these kinds of problems? And of course, so much of what we see is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from this. Um, it, and it's so much a bigger issue than just people coming in and, and getting treated and going. I'll tell you what, Sinai, uh, just to give you a few examples of what Sinai does, maybe uh, five quick things. Um, one is that uh, we have community health workers who are people from the community trained in issues like chronic disease and uh, trauma who are in our uh, emergency department, our trauma center, we're a level one trauma center, obviously, at Mount Sinai. And uh, as soon as the patient is stabilized, we're working with them through our community health workers to make sure that they're going back to a safe environment. Do you have a safe place to live? Do you have food? And we're, we'll talk more about that. We also work, we partner with a comp uh, an organization called Aclavis, and they do something a little bit different, but also, I heard the applause there, also in our uh, emergency department. Um, they are the violence interrupters that we've heard so much about, and they want to make sure that there's not retaliation. Uh, third thing is behavioral health. I mentioned post-traumatic stress disorder. From our research on Sinai Urban Health Institute, mm -hmm. one out of every four people, um, so, yeah, one out of every four people in the communities that we surveyed, nine vulnerable communities, have some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder. And when you're a witness or a victim of trauma, you can imagine how that's multiplied. Um, so we have a full range of behavioral health services. I, 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 I'm like a bad date. I warned him about this already. I'm just like. <laughs> it's very hard for me to be quiet and listen to <laughs> but someone. You're that's, giving me the that's, signal. No, no, no. <laughs> that's, I, I, was, I was sort of doing the. What I was thinking about as you were talking about yeah. uh, treating the community is one, one of the things that I was most struck by uh, when I was there for a few days in October and, of course, didn't get into the story was that a number of people who came into the ER uh, were not, in fact, sick in, in, a, in a critical sort of way, but they were alcoholics and drug addicts and homeless people and people with mental health issues and at the hospital they, they remember they were there for the sandwich and people still they were treated very oh, kindly and some people were sort of like put in a little bed in the corner they weren't they didn't need treatment but they needed to, to be there and people would chat with them and I watched very carefully how they were dealt with and they were dealt with a lot of respect no, and, thank and you for love. noting that and it was I really appreciate you noting that because I think when you work at whether it's Sinai or, or any of our uh, colleague safety net hospitals, you know, across Chicago or across the nation, I mean, people choose to come to work at a safety net, um, not because it's the most beautiful place to be. I mean, I'm always amazed when I go to other hospitals and they have matching furniture. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's... it's Those self-playing pianos like Evanston. <laughs> right, in the waterfall. Um, but um, people, it's almost like a self-selecting group um, that you come because you have a certain uh, mission in your bones that you want to make a hands-on difference. So I'm glad to hear you. You hadn't said that to me before. I'm glad to hear you. That mentioned you mentioned safety net. And I, I mean, I know you're all, most are healthcare professionals, but this is the city club, and so I assume some people are networking for jobs or dates or whatever. So let's talk about what a safety net is. I mean, people use the terms emergency yeah. room, uh, trauma unit, etc. Sure. Yeah. What, what is a level one trauma center, and how is that different from just an ER that you go to? Just a big ER. Right, just yeah. a big ER with a deep staff. Yeah, so a level one trauma center um, has uh, the highest level of um, equipment, highest trained uh, level of personnel, and the the, um, the array of medical specialties that you would need to address some kind of trauma, whether it's um, a homicide, whether it's uh, vehicle trauma, um, and uh, differing levels of level one, level two. I mean, the interesting thing is that um, I know one of the things that we talked about was uh, funding for level uh, level one trauma centers and that it's not a profitable uh, thing. There's actually been an increase across the country. There were uh, almost 120 
many new level one, level two trauma centers opened uh, across the country despite it not being profitable. So uh, I was going to ask about that. The, you know, you need support from often the federal government, not to get into the whole federal government issue, but yeah. uh, uh, the, the, uh, our president's budget fell yesterday and it's uh, bad yeah. news for social services. Yeah. But I, I get the sense that so far, whatever crisis is coming from a funding point of view hasn't come yet, that the money is still flowing from Washington to keep you got keep well, the doors open. And the lights yeah, open. I mean we'll keep the doors open. It's you know trauma like behavioral health uh, is a public health issue at its very core. We have to have trauma centers and we have to have them in the areas that uh, that are most plagued by the trauma. So yeah, we have to keep the doors open. But an interesting phenomenon because you know when I looked at, at the growth in trauma centers and it kind of has you scratching your head like why would people because what what you asked me about is true. It's it's not profitable per se. But um, with the Affordable Care Act, with more people who had been uninsured now being able to access insurance, all of a sudden in the areas that we serve and we refer to them as you know vulnerable communities, um, people who had not had insurance before now do. So some of that's going to be covered. There's also this halo effect of being being designated a trauma center because of the very excellence of the caregivers. Whether you are a safety, and we're one of five uh, trauma centers within Chicago city limits. So whether you're a safety net trauma center like um, like uh, Mount Sinai or like our colleague uh, Stroger, or you're at Northwestern. I mean, this is uh, this is still um, we still need to have the trauma centers open. Um, so, uh, so more people insured, but there's also the effect of uh, the perception. If you are a level one trauma center, you have that high level right. of skill, so you must be good in other areas you need as people well. People on call, you need because you never know oh where gosh, you're going to yes. get shot. You need an ophthalmologist, right, not, surgeon, or that right. kind of thing, and and. Um, Correct. Whenever people ask me about, you know, what would you do, Neil, about violence to curtail it, I, I always say, well, it, I would do everything because it's jobs and housing and family yes, and addiction yeah. and prenatal care and everything that, 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 that violence is a, a cause and a symptom. It causes these things and it's the result of these things. So uh, after you treat a patient, uh, how do you follow up as far as, you know, food and housing and education? Um, I mean, I assume you see a lot of situations where you, you slap a bandage on it and what else can you do? How does Sinai, yeah. try, we talked about the community a little bit, but also how does Sinai try to kind of keep the person from getting stabbed again? Yeah, yeah, that is a, that is a that is a big question. You know, when we look at where resources are invested in Chicago, um, and I, I'm you know as as Dr. Mazur pointed out, I'm a native New Yorker, um, but have been here a very long time. I've really come to consider Chicago my my hometown and love Chicago deeply. And and uh, people who've heard me speak know you know my thing is we can't have two levels of health care. Um, I live in River North. We can't have one level of health care in six. 60611 and an entirely different one if you happen to live in 60608. So I think the whole issue of number one, uh, we have a deep uh, um, Chicago Community Trust uh, called our Sinai Urban Health Institute door to door survey, a uh, treasure trove of data, and we should use that data, looking at where is the uh, food insecurity, the unemployment. In some of our communities, we have seven times the unemployment as the rest of Chicago. So you think about what causes the violence. This goes back to the first, the, the very first question. It's all related, and this, these have been big ahas for me since I've been at Sinai. Um, but you know, people who people need jobs. They need to know they have a safe and reliable place to live. Um, all of these things contribute. They need to have uh, choices people are making. They need to have food. Um, all of these things that make a stable, productive, um, and vibrant community are things that we as Chicago, and certainly the civic community, need to be investing in. Because we're never going to be a healthy city if yeah, we're healthy on one side of the city, but a scant six miles west and, and then south you know, we're facing all of these really life survival issues, as, as you point out, Neil. Well, as a newspaper columnist, I make the assumption, and it might be a mistake, that if I don't know something, nobody knows something. <laughs> so uh, with Sinai, when I think of it, I, yeah. I think of it as only the trauma. I mean, I, I don't oh, think yeah, of yeah. things beyond it. One nice thing when the Sinai people approached me is they didn't say, hey, let's talk about our new 
CAT scan or whatever, but I was sort of interested to get beyond that and also to not have that be the tail that wags the dog, but sort of say, what else are you doing that people never hear about because they only hear about the ER? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. There, there is sort of two sides for that as we were thinking about this. Um, you know, one side is uh, kind of the negative, and I don't want to gloss over it before I get to the positive because I think it's it's so important. It should be important to all of us in the room. Um, it's the impact that doing this kind of critical work has on the very people who are doing the work. I read an interesting study the other day. It was put out by the, um, it was called the International City County Management Association. Who knew there was such a thing? But they put out a really super interesting article about um, emergency medical, the first responders, and it had to do with, with suicide. And uh, from this huge survey, it turns out that, uh, and I think this is applicable to hospital workers as well, and certainly in the safety net, it turns out that the first responders had a um, contemplated suicide at a rate 10 times 10 times that of the rest of uh, the adult population and actually attempted suicide almost seven times that rate. And you gotta think, I mean, it's, it has to have something to do with the kind of work we're doing. So we're always cognizant of you know, the issue of caring for the caregivers, and that's one thing that I think isn't as evident. We always think, yeah, you work in the emergency department, oh, that's nice, you go to and you clock out, and, and it, that's not the way it is, it stays with us, okay? Well, so that came out in the story a bit, and I didn't yes, go in and tell you that, that you but did that's that. what I, I saw, it was that you care for someone and then you have to care for yourself or you can't show up the next day to care for them. Oh. Again. Oh my gosh, so true. And some of the yeah. stories people were telling me where uh, the victims are coming in from a fire and this, this victim was, was clinging to one of the nurses and she kept trying to kind of get her to the place and only later did she realize that this was her cousin and that this was her family coming in but that they were so smoke, you know, sooty, et cetera, from the fire that she didn't realize it and how, you know, she said, I had to call my pastor that day and, and, and part of the story and, and do go online, it was called uh, Code Yellow and, and you can read it online and, and, and my name in Mount Sinai, it'll pop up, was about the nurses looking out for each other, seeing yes, people right, withdrawn right, and, right. and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm talking instead of asking questions. No, but, no, uh, no, no, very, it was very, very important. We felt that you really nailed that and what you said in your promo wasn't gonna be necessarily a pretty piece, but you got it, you know, I think the highest compliment is that the caregivers said, that's it. I mean, well, that's that's what it's like. And that's, that's you know, it's negative, but it's also a, um, it, it's just incumbent on leadership to be able to looking uh, to look out for the caregivers and be able to recognize when people are just not going to be able to continue to carry that burden and then getting in there and and really helping to address that and look and as you said the caregivers <laughs> looking out for each other I, I think the other thing that you know we talk about what what might people not realize about Sinai or, or where we're where we're sitting right now is that um, Sinai for we're 100 years old. We just passed our 100th anniversary. And <laughs> Thank you. And serving the same vulnerable population started out with the Jewish Eastern Europeans, and, and um, the community has changed, but the mission hasn't. But what we've done for uh, decades is a lot of teaching and, and really preparing the next group of healthcare workers. We have at any one time over 700 um, students, whether it's uh, residents, people in fellowship, uh, pastors, um, pharmacists, nurses. So Sinai is really teaching and preparing people for that next, um, you know, their, their next roles and it's so badly needed in healthcare. We have a research institute. I've mentioned that several times. We've got uh, Sharon Homan, president of Sinai Urban Health Institute, that's got epidemiologists and biostatisticians and community health workers really digging into, because we've got to do this to be able to solve the problems like the violence in Chicago. We have to understand what's causing it or else we're just throwing money at a problem that we can't dig into. And I see we've got a DePaul table here. We love our DePaul 
colleagues. We work so closely with DePaul on urban health solutions, and um, so we're happy to see you here. But we've got to dig in and understand it. We've got a community institute, Sinai Community Institute, that's got uh, just uh, 14, 15 uh, very relevant programs in the community, and people may not be aware of that. Our partnerships, we can't do anything alone. We partner with not only Chicago Department of Public <laughs> Health, but also um, organizations that are looking at, we've got people returning from, from jail. Uh, what do we need to do to get them to work? We've got to invest in the workforce development. We've got many partners around that. So speaking of partnership, as CEO, you go around the country, you see other places, other cities, uh, how they're yes, yeah. addressing the issues that Sinai is addressing. Um, are, how do we rank compared to other cities and anything in, that you've noticed that other places do that we could consider doing here in Chicago that might help uh, solve the, the things we're coping with? Boy, if ever there was a trick question, it mm. was that one. Well, I'm sorry. I think there's only one answer. We're the best, right? Oh, he well, said, how do we rank? Well, well of course, of course, know, we're the best. Yeah, OK. <laughs> you don't have to be the best. The president has shown us that claiming to the best doesn't necessarily oh. make you the best. I'm not oh. saying both, but I'm saying that it's, you don't have to say that. Yeah. Um, no. Okay, no no argument there. Well, you know, uh, I think we're not... Move on to the next question. No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. No, because no, it, it is a really great question. There is this wonderful uh, fellowship. I mean, that's that's the interesting thing about uh, health care. It is, and we were just talking about this. I'm trying to think, who, who was I talking to? And we've got so many so many friends of health care here today. Um, but... Uh, you know, when we, I, I sit on the Board of America's Essential Hospitals, with, which is the Safety Net National Association. So I get a chance to talk to people about what they're doing. And, and there's a prize called the Gage Awards, and I'm on the, the award committee. So I had the privilege of reading over 40 different projects from across the country to see what people are doing to address these very issues that we're facing here. And I think, I think the good news is that uh, healthcare has a lot of fellowship and, we sh and partnership um, and collaboration and we share <coughs> together. Um, but uh, we're facing food insecurity. Um, uh, Henry Ford in uh, Detroit has a wonderful program in, in large safety net uh, partnering with Food Depository to actually have a grocery store where people are writing prescriptions for that. We're doing something similar here with a number of hospitals through Westside United and, and within Sinai's own ED. But there are uh, issues of the food insecurity, housing, um, countywide vaccinations mm -hmm. that uh, virtually is being done across the country. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, a lot of sharing in both ways. Just uh, can I tell a quick story? Because I yeah, uh, just going to a different place. I do medical stories sometimes, and I last year I were two years ago now I went to Philadelphia to Chops Children's Hospital yeah. of Philadelphia to talk to a plastic surgeon who was bringing muscles from a kid's thigh to his face so that he could smile. He had been uh, uh, cancer had taken his ability yeah. to smile away, and so they're giving me the tour of the hospital just because I'm there. And the, the, there's this big room. It says uh, uh, Mother's Milk Bank. And I said, well, what is that? And they say, well, you know, a lot of the, the premature babies and blah, 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 and they're given milk, and so this milk is collected. And I said, well, but who gives it? And they said, well, it's generally, it's often uh, women whose children have died, oh. and they, they donate this milk as a way to help some good to come of it. And I, I did a story last year in the paper, and I never would have guessed that this was a thing had the woman not been strolling me through the place. So just yeah, getting out yeah, and seeing yeah. other places is... Uh, is, is a great experience. Yeah, that is a really interesting story. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to just go back to something, because you said, what, what wouldn't people know? And, and somebody reminded me of a story. We, we have um, Chicago's largest refugee clinic. Uh, of course, before, uh, before 2016, it was very, very, very busy. And I, I don't say that in a, in a joking way. Um, and the number of refugees coming into Chicago has gone down, but there's still a need for um, you know, medical clearance. You have to get cleared when you come in to, uh, to Chicago. And somebody reminded me of the story that um, our clinic, which has been around for a very long time, uh, had a family that uh, landed at O'Hare. They came from the Congo. And uh, one of the children, an eight-year-old, became very, very ill on the flight over and landed at O'Hare and, and died. Um, the family still needed to be, uh, the family was quarantined, um, still needed to go through their medical checks before they got onto their final destination, which was Texas. 
So um, our clinic, which was at the time on Tui Avenue, um, uh, gave them, you know, their, their medical care and could have said, you know, uh, checkbox, you know, bon voyage. But once our staff learned um, what happened, one staff member, and, and mind you, nobody asked them to do this, uh, one staff member started a, um, a monetary fund drive one so that people, they would at least be able to bury the child. Mm -hmm. One staff member did a food drive and, and just um, on and a clothing drive and just on and on. I mean, just imagine you land in a foreign country, you don't speak the language, you don't have relatives there to greet you, and one of your ch children passes away. I mean, so these are the kinds of things. I mean, yeah. similar that that generosity of spirit that we see in health and social services for well, telling this story about the immigrants. I mean, you know, Sinai has this hundred year tradition, and and, and we uh, take for granted that it's here. But I was thinking of Michael Reese, you know, the yeah. former hospital, which sure. was yeah. used to have in its charter that they had to treat Russian immigrants when they arrived. And what they found was a lot of the immigrants had ailments that we don't have. They would complain of tzertzi bolit, which was heartache, and they would want valerian root and different things that they really shouldn't have. And uh, it was an amazing just to see the number of Russians that were that depended on them uh, for survival. Uh, yeah. Uh, you mentioned it's mental health, and, and let's talk about that because that's you know that's something that you deal with at the hospital, but that we as a society still there's a stigma. I know we have the, the Kennedy Foundation here <laughs> trying to deal with people and trying to. Do you find that even even in your community? when patients come in that there's a, a, a re reluctance that people have to, to seeking that kind of treatment as opposed to medical treatment? Yeah, and, and in fact, that's where I first heard Neil. He spoke at, uh, at the Kennedy Forum. I immediately went out and bought uh, two of the books. Um, so, Out of the yes. wreck I rise, I should have brought a copy. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was uh, really wonderful. But, but I think that uh, Kennedy Forum is, is a fantastic, and started by Patrick Kennedy, um, to, for, I think, two major areas areas of focus. One is to, um, to lessen, uh, obviously we'd like to eliminate the stigma attached to mental health and substance abuse. And the second is um, parity and benefits, that these are illnesses. That, um, so th those are two things that, that I'm very proud that Chicago has Kennedy Forum of Illinois, and of course mm -hmm. we are, we're part of that. Um, we ourselves believe that uh, there's got to be, and again, behavioral health, uh, not unlike trauma, is one of those services that is so needed, and, and that was like a big, you take out your yellow highlighter and highlight that in the Sinai Urban Health Institute uh, research on what's needed in Chicago. Um, and uh, so we're really focused on how do we reinvest in healthcare. When we, um, when we got uh, monies in from the Affordable Care Act coming in, people used to treat who had no money, um, now had insurance. We reinvested that. We invested $10 million on our South Campus at Holy Cross Hospital in mental, much needed mental health services, opening up a brand new unit. Uh, there was no inpatient for uh, services for, uh, God bless you, <laughs> between uh, three and five miles around Holy Cross. Um, we opened uh, with the Catholic Charities and outpatient uh, services. There were no services. So reinvesting in the access to services is just wildly um, important. And then we also, have to, we also have to be role models in terms of acceptance. Um, and within our system, uh, we have a number of programs uh, between what we do for our caregivers, our own caregivers, and then a special focus on uh, physician wellness as well. You, you mentioned suicide. Is, is addiction a problem among staffers and that kind of thing, the way it is with police officers? And uh, I'm sorry, is suicide uh, You, you mentioned addiction? suicide yeah. of, 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 as a risk of, of, of uh, healthcare workers, and, and I was just wondering yeah. if it did, maybe this is talking out of school, but I was just... No, no, I'm just thinking, because I, I will honestly tell you, do I think it's there? Yeah, I'm sure that yeah. it's there. Um, has it risen to, uh, I can only speak for Sinai, it has not uh, risen as an issue at Sinai, um, but we also make sure that our leaders are focusing, as I mentioned mm -hmm. before, focusing on keeping that eye out for who really seems to be struggling. Um, a, little, a little pivot on that is um, we have, uh, what has risen up is, uh, I've never seen this in any of the hospitals I've ever been at, we have, I think, a disproportionate share of caregivers 
who have, uh, through violence, um, mostly random homicides, uh, lost, and it's typically a husband, a son, uh, typically male. Um, we have caregivers who have, who have said, uh, you know, coming to work was the only thing that got me through this. And this is terrible to say. You know, I'm proud of it, and it's a terrible thing to say, uh, to have to say. Um, we have a group of caregivers that form, um, picture a, uh, like a telephone tree when, because inevitably it happens, when one of our other caregivers loses a relative, the word spreads among this group who have been there and they reach out to the caregiver. They know about it before any of us do. Um, they reach out to the caregiver and make sure that we know what the caregiver needs. And sometimes it's something that I, I hope that none of us would even be thinking about. Do you have enough money for the funeral? I mean, we've had caregivers who've had to do that. So those are the kinds of things. It's more, you know, back to where we started, it's more the violence. Well, that was one of the extraordinary things about yeah. the story was the, the head of your uh, trauma center had, had, I asked her how she got interested in doing this yeah. work. And yes, she said, well, yes, she was yes. mugged and stabbed. And then and seeing the treatment she got made her want to transfer that part of the hospital, which is a, a real personal uh, commitment. We're running short on time, and we're going to get to the questions. But I, I want to, in parting, you know, we've kind of looked past back over 100 years as well. But I wanted to, since you're here and you've got plans, and maybe there are some plans that you could share with people so you can, oh, yeah. they can say, I was at the city club, and we heard Mount Sinai is doubling in size, building a new tower, whatever uh, that is <laughs> that you're doing that you want to share with us. To me. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Even though you, you did say in your promo we couldn't talk about our hundred years of what was it uninterrupted change success. success. Yes. yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's. But yeah, a few things that we're we're really excited about because with all the things that are, are still challenges, and it's not just challenges for Sinai. If we're in Chicago, it's challenges for all of us. Um, but the things that we can look forward to is uh, the reinvestment um, into these traditionally disinvested uh, communities. Um, we have a, a program that. Uh, I think really embodies the new spirit of investment in communities like North Lawndale. It's called Ogden Commons. You might have read something about it, but it's um, a partnership with Cinespace and, and Habitat, Chicago Housing Authority, and, and Sinai. And it's going to bring on Ogden Avenue um, 11 acres of um, mixed income housing, uh, about uh, 450 new units right there. It's going to bring um, retail, we have no retail. It's going to bring three restaurants. I know that sounds like a small thing, but if you walk out on Ogden Avenue, there's no place right now. Um, Dr. McKinney, who's here with us today, has done an amazing visionary in the Illinois Medical District, is really changing the face of what's going on there. And just west of Western, um, we are emulating what you've done so well for the city. Um, so we have uh, Wintrust Bank is taking uh, space there. There's no bank. These are the things that make a community healthy and productive. So we're super excited about that. And we're moving some of the programs that are much needed, like dialysis. Um, we're going to be able to double space ambulatory surgery. So that's coming up. Um, expansion of our emergency department bays so that we can have more, uh, you know, again, sadly, there's a need for this, but we can have more uh, ambulances come in and, and uh, get treated efficiently. Um, and then big shift from inpatient to outpatient. That's where healthcare is going. We want to shrink the hospitals and really be out in the community partnering with our, our uh, community um, uh, partners with uh, healthcare clinics and our schools. Um, but it's not about the hospitals anymore. It's really about keeping people healthy where they live. So I see we've got some questions. We do have some questions. I, I don't say where these are from, correct? Or do I, do I say where these are yeah, from? Yeah, sure. Give them credit. OK. It's, it's not like the whistleblower. This is from, I don't want to embarrass anyone is the thing. <laughs> skate by with anonymous. Okay, this is Dr. <laughs> Bruce Handler. Um, and he says, as a physician, a physician? Oh, I'm sorry? Uh, as a physician, physician, do you predict successful oh, pushback? Oh, me as a physician. Yeah, yeah. Okay. or maybe he said, as a physician, do you uh, predict successful uh, pushback of physicians against insurance control, check the box EMR, or worsening business as usual, including burnout, depression, and suicide? Yay. Okay, well, I'm not, I, I, I don't know where Dr. Handler is. Um, I, am, I am not a physician. Um, 
You know, again, I can only speak uh, for Sinai. And I will tell you that one thing, I've been in hospitals all across the city and in the suburbs. And one thing that really uh, struck me about Sinai when I came there 13 years ago was the, uh, it, it's not a physician mentality of us against them. It's really a circling the wagon about how can we, as a care team, keep people healthy. Um, so there isn't that divide that I think maybe some communities are seeing. Look, do, do physicians and I'm sure other, other caregivers hate, you know, when there's an electronic, electronic medical record that's being put in? Yes, everybody bemoans that and everybody says, well, it takes me away from the patient. And I think that if you don't watch for that and prepare for that, that's true. Um, but in the big picture, it's not an us against them. It's really how do we work together to do what we need to do. This is a bit out of your bailiwick. It's from Ted Z. Manuel. He says, what are the prospects for medical care in sparsely populated, thinning out parts of the country? Which I guess Illinois, if we're not careful, um, where doctors and infrastructure are scarce. Do you have any insights from Sinai that could apply to that? Well, not, not so much from Sinai per se, but I did serve on a, an American Hospital Association task force on uh, critical access and, and safety net hospitals. And ironically, the conclusion we came to, you know, not much of a surprise, that many of the same issues that we face, even though we're in an urban community, you know, as a, if you were a physician in private practice, you wouldn't set up where we are because you quite simply couldn't make a living. It's the same thing with the critical access hospitals. But this is where we learn to work creatively. Community health workers, uh, and, and not taking the place of physicians, but community health workers helping to keep people healthy and identify people who are at risk and getting them into care. Um, what we call mid-level providers, which would be nurse practitioners, for example. Um, being able to uh, go out to homes and uh, and provide care and then get people into care. There are ways besides having a physician on every corner. We're blessed in Chicago uh, with so many uh, medical professionals and, and schools, but um, there, are, there are ways to get health care to people. Telehealth is another big issue, of course, which is, you know, kind of a Is that a real thing? Because I see those ads and I'm not, you know. <laughs> it, is, it is a real thing and in fact on your smartphones right um, that is a huge application uh, that people can access um, and it's not just for the critical access uh, the rural hospitals or for the safety nets it's also a, a level of convenience you know that you can pull out your phone and it, literally and I've seen this application where you can show a rash to a physician if you've got a high resolution phone and the physician is going to either say yeah you need to come in or you know go to Walgreens I'm going to um, at our Walgreens table. Yay! That was unintentional, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you can, uh, I hope CVS isn't here, sorry. Um, but uh, you can now, uh, you can get your health care without having to show up in the emergency department. So lots of creative ways. That's the exciting thing about health care. We've got a world of technology intersecting with the human touch where we're going to be doing things differently. Okay. This is from Gayla Brockman from the Michael Reese Health Trust. So I'm Yay. glad we had a shout out to Michael Reese. She says, talk about how the merger of the four hospitals, Mercy, South Shore, St. Bernard and Advocate Trinity impacts Sinai. Okay, so, um, and we applaud, we just sent out an email to our staff, and, and the aggregation of safety net hospitals is something that Sinai has been talking about uh, for the last two to three years. So we are applauding that on the south side, um, and particularly those hospitals, uh, three of the four are, are um, east of, uh, of the Dan Ryan. Um, we're applying, we all have to do things differently. There's, we are in the era of healthcare transformation. And that means that for the overbedding that we have, and it's true across the country, but it's true in Chicago, we're all gonna have to partner together to do things differently. So we are applauding, um, we're talking with them about uh, you know Holy Crosses on the South Side. And um, whether it's a merger, whether it's a collaboration, there are a lot of ways to get at that same end. So we don't know what um, their group is going to end up actually looking like, but uh, according to the state, this is just the start of what the state is going to help support. Oh, so thank, thank you, you Gail. It's a really great question. Uh, Marie Bullock, I, I assume this is sort of a theoretical question you're asking and not something that's... that's uh, she says, if Sina received an unrestricted philanthropic gift of $20 million, uh, <laughs> what would you spend it on? 
Wow. Better CEO suite or <laughs> I can tell you that'd be the last <laughs> that'd be the last thing. Um, oh my goodness, Marie, thank you. Uh, <laughs> what would we spend it on? I would assume that um, we would be looking first at how do we, and when I say Sinai, if we got a gift like that, yes, there are a million things I'd like to do. We're in uh, some of our facilities, not, not necessarily the patient care ones, but we're a big campus. Some of our buildings de facto are 100 years old. Um, we, would, we would love to downsize the hospitals. We would love to uh, and have something new for our community. Um, but I think just just thinking about the way that, that healthcare should go and how it's transforming, we would look for partnerships um, that would uh, impact the totality of the health in the communities that we serve. So that means things like the food insecurity and the workforce creation, because that all has to do with, with great health. Marie, do you have a lead on that? <laughs> Is that I'm just, <laughs> it could be. <laughs> This is an interesting question from Megan Everett at the McCormick Foundation. She says there are about 400,000 veterans in the Chicago area. She says Chicago land because it's yes. a Tribune thing, but I'll say the Chicago area. Uh, <laughs> representing all races, ethnicities, um, and neighborhoods, not all veterans can or want to use the VA. They often fate with health disparities, both mental and physical, uh, et cetera. How does Sinai address military veterans? Yeah, good question. I do want to give a shout out again, similar to Michael Reese Health Trust to the McCormick Foundation, who have been not only great supporters of Sinai and a number of our important projects, but also of uh, Chicago and the needs of Chicago. Um, you know, we when uh, the, the VA here uh, received a new um, director, uh, maybe three or four years, maybe it was four years ago. And um, we had a wonderful uh, passion for vets and, and making change. And we had the opportunity to go out and sit with his staff and sit with him. And um, what we've agreed to is what they cannot handle and to the, to the extent that um, we would, uh, and of course we would accept whomever wanted to come to us, but we want to be respectful of where insurance coverage is, but uh, very open to collaborating and, and serving. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Olison, Olison, Olison Lawrence mm -hmm. uh, asks, tell us more of uh, the relevance of this talk to individuals in group homes. I'm not sure what group homes means. Is Olison here? Can we can make, maybe we can clarify that? Yeah, like as opposed to individual treatments like misericordia type of thing, because that's a controversy. Adult, adult development with group homes? Yeah. That, that's all I could think of. Maybe, maybe uh, that's sort of not quite. It's in the community where adults are developing this study. Yeah. Ah, OK. Um, you know, we have, thank you. Uh, we've got, did everybody hear that? It's uh, adult group homes where adults with developmental uh, disabilities might reside. Um, you know, we have, we have so many partners out in the community, uh, whether it's uh, Catholic Charities, social services. And um, we don't believe that we have to do, um, and we can't do everything, nor should we be. So wherever there, if there would be a need uh, for health care, if there's a need for education that we provide, um, we're always ready to partner. We do not, and I could be there could be something going on that I don't know about. It wouldn't be the first time, but um, we do not have a direct care provision to a home. I'm going to look at my, my tables. Do we have a developmental disabilities? I don't think that we have a tie. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so we're not providing direct service, but we would always be happy to partner to be complementary to services that, that are needed. Can I put in two cents on that? Because uh, uh, to me, there's such a ghastly history of large scale homes for people with disabilities in Illinois that it's given them a bad name. And perhaps I'm too influenced from writing about misericordia occasionally, but to me, it should be a continuum of care where some people are on their own and some people need to be in, in group settings. And that I don't see reason why, you know, if you're, if you're in a patient or oriented or a person or humanity oriented system. I don't see why you have to choose one or the other when people have different needs. But that could be Sister Rosemary Connolly speaking through me like a ventriloquist. So I don't know. One more question. Uh, Ted Manuel again. He says, society already pays the cost of medical care for the indigent through padded prices for their own insurance and through calculated overcharging by hospitals. It's socialized. I don't know if this is a question. Um, well, how can society accept that reality and change our overall approach? <laughs> I don't know if I want to accept that. 30 seconds or 30 less. Seconds. Yeah. Um, 
I, I don't even know where to start with that one. Um, I can tell you that uh, I can only speak from the safety net perspective, <laughs> and we certainly are not benefiting if there are padded if there are padded charges. Um, we certainly are not benefiting when you've got sixty percent Medicaid, twenty uh, percent Medicare, seven percent absolutely no pay. The safety net community uh, is not um, is not thriving based on that. I think that the best that we can do is to um, look at. Who really needs the care and what resources do we as a society and certainly as Chicago uh, need to get behind so we can really make this a healthier Chicago for everybody. And then like, we have a big hand for Karen Teitelbaum.